Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Did everybody get a bulletin this morning? Did everybody get a bulletin this morning? If you did not get a bulletin, let's, uh, lift your hand. We'll make sure you get one. Anybody did not get a bulletin? Uh, to keep you uh, updated on what's going on in the church. So uh, we do have a men's ministry meeting tomorrow. Actually, we call it Men on the Move. We'll be meeting tomorrow night at 6. We usually have uh, uh, dinner together, and then we uh, discuss the Word and have a time of fellowship. want to invite each and every one of you uh, men to come and be a part of that. We didn't get our sign-up sheet out early enough to let everybody sign up like we normally do, so I apologize for that. Uh, but just as a quick show of hands, how many of you men will be here tomorrow just so we know how many to plan for? So one, two, three. Keep them up for just a moment. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, should I count you twice, Devon, since you're reaching so high oh okay all right all right compensating are you all right okay thank you very much and then also uh the ladies of joy are going to be doing a dinner and a movie night uh that's in the bulletin too isn't it so just make sure you pay attention to that and, and so forth uh just uh, fyi uh they accepted our offer on the house there on uh, 982 yeah, got most of the inspections done. We're working our way towards that goal where we get the key and it's ours. So praise God. We're very happy with that. And uh, it's if you don't know, we've, we're purchasing a house on uh, uh, Route 982. Uh, there, it's an all white brick house on the uh, east side of the road. So uh, so blessed, and we thank God for that. It's truly uh, an opportunity for us. We haven't been homeowners since 2008. And how many of you know that when you go from, uh, or excuse me, 2012, wasn't it? Where's my wife at? Anyway, 2012, that doesn't sound right. 2010, there it is. 2010 is when we sold our house. We went from a five-bedroom, uh, 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 three baths, you know, two-car garage to my mother-in-law's uh, basement. Yeah, <clears throat> and her basement wasn't as big as this section of chairs right here with two children in high school. And, uh, huh? Oh, I thought you said something. Anyway, we won't go down that road any further than we have to. We're just grateful that we're here in Pennsylvania. Amen. We're glad to be here. We're glad to see the blessings of the Lord. I tell you, you know, when we came here, we... we God just gave us this saying, and it's so true, and that is it's a new day at sunrise. Amen? You know, our church, we, we, we kind of had to start from scratch when we got here and, and rebuild and, and keep moving towards that goal. How many of you know that God's got a vision for us personally as well as a church? Amen? And so we're just taking it step at a time as we can, moving forward and seeing the plan of God come to pass in our own lives as well as in our church. And, and you know, we're just so blessed to be here. We're, we're ecstatic about seeing what God is doing in the lives. For me as a pastor, the most important thing that I judge our success as a church by isn't how many people we can get in our auditorium, but the fruit of God's Word in your life. When I can see the Word of God working in you and through you, it's like, there we go, Lord. We got it. We're, doing, we're on the right track. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All right. Well, we're going to go on today with the message. Uh, I'm going to ask you, if you would, just turn in your Bibles to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll be looking at verse 13. Before we read the verse, I just want to remind you of a few things that I shared with you last week. Uh, uh, I start sharing with you about three guiding principles that will help us to know what to do when we don't know what to do. And, and, and you know what? Sometimes when we're trying to carry out the will of God, maybe we know what God has asked us to do or told us to do, but we're kind of uncertain in taking those steps. Well, these three principles always help us to go in the right direction, even when we know the direction. In other words, it not only helps us to know which way to go, but it, it also helps us to know how to go in the way we should go. And that is that we see here in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13, it says, And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, these three things will always help us to be able to know which way to go. How many of you know every one of us have moments in life where we're just like, you know, I just don't know, right? And then you find yourself, you know, somebody will say something to you. Well, you know, I just don't know. 
How many of you know you can almost seem to wrap yourself in this I don't know thing to where you feel paralyzed? I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know. Right? Well, three things here that we can uh, use from God's Word that will help us to always know. Now, we may not know the exact details of everything that God has for us, maybe not even the immediate step that's in front of us, but at least these will be like a uh, 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 guidance or, or, or uh, uh, directors, if you will, that will help kind of move us along the way. Because how many of you know that if, we're t if the direction we're going is a direction of love, if, if it is in the context of God's love, it's a good direction. Because how many of you know God will never lead you where he doesn't want you to go? God will never ask you to do something that he doesn't want you to do. And God will never tell us to do something or ask us to do something or anything that's contrary to his word. And see, that's the cool thing about these three things. You can never do any one of these three things, especially all three of them together, and ever disobey the word of God. And so, if you remember, I shared with you last week about how there's a biblical principle of in the mouths of two or three witnesses. Always keep that in mind. Anytime you can find two or three scriptures that supports the, the idea, the doctrine, the view, and you're not taking them out of context, you can be sure that those are biblical truths. All right? So let's continue on today and looking at uh, these three things. Now, <clears throat> I want to take time and look at the subject of faith for just a moment. We've already looked at love. Remember, we were looking at the subject of love before we came into these three guiding principles. And so we won't spend time on that today. But I do want to take time to look at the subject of faith and hope. Now, how many of you know that we cannot address either of those subjects in the entirety, if you will, in the moment of time we have today. So I'm just going to touch on them. Hopefully I won't create more questions and answers, but if I do, feel free to ask, uh, uh, and I will do my best to help you along the way. That's why I'm here. But I just want to share with you, just briefly anyway, some important truths about the subject of faith and hope, and then we'll tie it together with love, and, and, and then what we're going to do towards the end of the service, we'll partake of our Lord's table uh, uh, using those three guiding principles as a way to receive from the table as well as a demonstration of how you can apply it to your life in other areas as well. All right? Praise the Lord. Okay, let's go with uh, to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I think everybody here probably knows that verse. Does everybody know that verse? You've heard that verse? Yeah, pretty much everybody knows it, right? But yet the, the simple truth is this. We have to hear it and we have to hear it, and we have to hear it. Sometimes we need to hear it more often. You know what I mean? We have to stay in it. Because how many of you know that this world is constantly trying to undermine our faith, trying to tell us to believe something else that's different than the Word of God? Uh, we live in a society right now that is telling us all kinds of things that are normal or right and so forth, and they're not. And so we have to stick with the Word of God. Amen? So faith always comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, when, uh, when it comes to knowing what to do, obviously, you're going to always want to seek the Word of God. What does the Scripture tell you what to do? For you that have smartphones, pads, and tablets, and all that stuff, you can simply surf the Internet and find Scriptures that will help you to know what to do. But if you're not one of those people that like to use the Internet... If you don't like using smartphones and things like that, then here's something that you can do. This is what I used to do before those things ever came about, and that is this. You ought to have a strong concordance. All right? If you're not going to use a smartphone, a tablet, or something like that, the Internet, you need to have a strong concordance because in that strong concordance, you can look up verses and find out what the Scripture actually says. And if you, if you have one that's coded to the back of it that has the uh, dictionary in it, the, the lexicon, you can also check the Hebrew and Greek and see what those words actually mean. And so I encourage you, if, you, if you're not going to use the Internet or those kinds of resources, then make sure you purchase a good strong concordance. And then the other thing is you're going to want a, a, a dictionary synonyms and antonyms. You know why? Because you know what? We don't all speak Victorian English. One of the things I learned when I used to seek out Scripture, trying to find Scripture that would support or to help me understand what God's Word had to say about something, is I would be thinking of my modern terminology. Anybody ever have a word come to you, a thought about a certain subject, and you think of it in the terminologies that you use? But you won't find that in the King James, especially if you're using the authorized King James, which is the uh, Victorian English. But you know what? You can go to a dictionary of synonyms and antonyms, and you can look up the synonyms, and you'll find it more often than not. 
you'll find a synonym that will help you find scripture to that subject. Sometimes you may even need to do that using the electronic uh, assistances or resources that we have today. Now, turn with me to Mark chapter 11, and we'll read verses 22 to 24. This is the most uh, 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 description or descriptive teaching Jesus ever gave on the subject of faith, right here in Mark 11, uh, 22 through 24. And Jesus answered and said to them, Yes, sir. Do you remember that what had happened here was they had uh, gone to Jerusalem and then they got up in the morning and they were on their way to the temple and, and uh, Jesus was hungry. He saw a fig tree, thought he was going to get some figs off of it, found out there was nothing there. He cursed the fig tree. The next day they get up and they're on their way back to Jerusalem again and they notice that the fig tree is dried up. And one of them says, Master, look at the fig tree which you cursed. And then Jesus said here in verse 22, so Jesus answered and said, to them have faith in God the actual Greek text reads this way it says have the God kind of faith have the God kind of faith well if there's a God kind of faith then there must be other kinds of faith if you will but there's only one legitimate faith and that's the God kind of faith amen Verse 23, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, what things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Let's take a moment and look at what Jesus is telling us here. He says that we're to have faith in God, or as I mentioned, the God kind of faith. Well, what is the God kind of faith? The God kind of faith is that you can say. Notice he says, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. Some people want to start a debate about whether that was a literal mountain or not. Listen, folks, it doesn't matter if it's a literal mountain or not. What matters is whether the mountains in your life are moving. That's what counts. <clears throat> <clears throat> but notice he says here, he says, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes. Believes where? Come on, help me out this morning. Believes where? In his heart. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe in your heart, right? So that means we can believe in the heart and we can doubt in our heart. Now, when it says heart, it's not talking about our physical muscle pumping blood through our bodies. It's talking about us, the spirit being that lives in these houses of flesh. That means the real you, the spirit being, you can choose to believe as an act of your will. You can choose to believe or you can choose not to believe. Have you ever had somebody tell you something and you're like, nope, I don't believe that for a minute. That's you choosing not to believe. Or have you had somebody tell you something? Maybe you've seen it in God's Word, and you're like, yep, that's true. I, could, I believe that. I do. Let me ask you this. How many of you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? See, that was a choice. But many of us believe it so much and so long, we just automatically respond. We don't even think about it anymore. Right? We choose. It's an act of our will. And it comes from our heart. Okay? He says, but believes that those things he says. Now, you have to understand something. I know people have taken truth and made it something other than truth. How many of you know that's just simply a lie? Are you with me this morning? Okay, you're pretty quiet. Maybe you're just thinking. All right, look here, though. I want you to notice something. Here's something that's very important to the subject of faith if you're going to understand faith. Watch. For assuredly, I say unto you, whoever says. Everybody say, say. You got to understand that word. To this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he, notice it didn't say believe. That's where most folks make their mistake. I'll read it to you again, and I'm going to give you another scripture. So remember, in the mouths of two or three, let every word be established. So I'm not trying to get you to believe something without showing you biblical proof of it, all right? But notice right here, he said, for surely I say to you, whoever says, so you got to say. There's a difference between believing and saying. Believing is what you do in your heart. Saying is what you do with your mouth, all right? Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. So there we see the part. The heart's got to be there. You got to believe in your heart but believes in it, that those things he says. So you got to say it. 
will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatsoever things you ask, isn't that a form of saying? When you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. See, it's very important that you understand that faith is not believing and believing is not faith. Thank you for that, amen. <clears throat> See, we believe with our heart. But our faith is only active when we say with our mouth. Faith is not active when we just simply believe. Faith is only active when we are saying or acting. That's why it says over in James that faith without works is dead. The Weymouth translation says it this way. Faith without corresponding action is dead. See, you got to have corresponding action. If your faith, if all your faith is is just believing in your heart and nothing else, or if it's just simply cheap talk, because how many of you know some people do that? They go on and on talking about faith, 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 faith to the point where you want to just say, well, you know what? There's other things in the word besides faith. You know what I mean? They drive it in the, in the ground. And the problem with that is that's actually a tool of the enemy to discourage other people from really pursuing faith, understanding faith, because how many of you know that without faith you cannot please God? Hebrews 11.6. For without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, how could you get saved? For by grace we are saved through faith. For it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith is a very important part of our life. Did you know that the Bible says that God is a God of faith? In the beginning, God said. And it was so. Whether you realize it or not, this whole world is designed purposely by God to be a system of faith. You know why? Remember what Jesus said? If you have faith as a child. See, it was never meant to be hard. Faith was never meant to be hard. It was always meant to be simple. I remember one time I was going through a struggle in my life and I was struggling with my faith. And, and some of you have heard me say this before, but I was struggling, man. I mean, and I'm like, man, I know what faith is. I know, I know, but why am I having such, I mean, you know, because how many of you know the Bible talks about that where Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith, right? How many of you have heard of where it says, and they had great faith? So faith is measurable, isn't it, right? Or how about when the disciples were talking to the Lord and, and they said, Lord, increase our faith. So faith is can be increased. And so I'm going through this thing in my life and I'm beginning to think, you know what, maybe I just don't have enough faith. Anybody ever been there before? I'm talking about after Bible college. I'm talking about being a pastor. I'm talking about here I am, you know, and I'm supposed to be teaching others and now I'm beginning to wonder, do I even have enough faith? So don't feel bad when you find yourself there too. It happens to all of us. No condemnation. And so I'm struggling. I'm almost to the point of embarrassment because I'm supposed to be the teacher, not the one who needs to be taught again kind of thing, right? And it's like, man, Lord, I start crying out to God. And, you know, I heard the Spirit of the Lord speak to my heart. Didn't hear an audible voice or anything like that, but I heard the Spirit of the Lord speak to my heart. And he said these words. Change my life. Faith is always as simple as the day you got saved. And if it becomes anything else, You've complicated it. I'll say it again. Faith is always, and I emphasize the word always, always as simple. Did you get that one? Simple as the day you got saved. And if it ever becomes anything else, you've complicated it. Now, I don't know about you, but I just wasn't that biblically smart when I got saved. I couldn't even quote the, the, the books of the Bible anymore. Forward, backwards, anyway. I couldn't, I barely could tell you Matthew and Mark, Luke, and John. Maybe not, even that. Amen. But you know what? I got saved. I love that song, Got Saved. Amen. How many, of you ever, how many of you remember the day you got saved? Now, I know saved means a lot of things, but I'm talking about the day you got born again saved. Amen. How many of you remember that day? 
Woo, praise God. September the 9th, 1979. Never will forget it. Thank God. So glad I got saved. But you know what? That's a, that's a point in my life I can always reflect back on. And you know what? I wasn't living right. If anything, the truth be told, I was looking for the exit, literally. And the only reason I wasn't going through it was because I knew my cousin would drag me right back into the church and embarrass me in front of everybody. So I sat there, got under conviction of the Holy Ghost. How I many of you remember the conviction of the Holy Ghost? Man, we don't hear much about that anymore, do we? But anyway, the Holy Ghost was convicting me. He was helping me to see that I, I was on the wrong track and that God would take me back. And so anyway, they gave the altar call. I couldn't tell you a thing the preacher preached. All I remember was they gave the altar call and I needed to go forward and give my life to Christ. I was as dumb as a rock, man. I don't mind telling you. But I went forward. I just acted on what I, heard, I knew, what I believed, what I had. And guess what? I walked out of that church a whole different person. Changed me forever. I, didn't, I couldn't quote Mark eleven twenty two through 24. I couldn't, the only thing I could quote was John eleven twenty five 25 about Jesus being the resurrection and the life. And even then I couldn't do very good about that. It's the only thing I had. And I got saved. Got delivered from drugs. Got my mind healed. Totally transformed my life. Dumb as a rock. And now, for some reason, we come to church and we think we've got to become these spiritual giants, get incredibly educated in the Word. We've got to be, I mean, we've got to be all this and that and a bag of chips with it before we can get anything from God. Listen, if we got born again, that's the most important thing you can get on this earth. If you got born again, you got it. You got the best there is to get. You got the, you got the top. Not the bottom working your way up. You got the top. We just need to let it work its way on down through the rest of our life. Amen? And you know what? If you can get born again with whatever faith you got, I promise you that same simple faith will change the rest of your life if you'll just keep operating the same way. Now, you can gain understanding. You can gain biblical knowledge and so forth. You can increase your faith. You can continue to develop yourself as a Christian and so forth. That will all help you and benefit you, and you should do that. But don't make that a substitute for understanding and operating in just simple day-to-day -day faith, the same faith that got you born again. Because, see, the same faith that got you born again is the same faith that gets you filled with the Holy Ghost. It's the same faith that gets you healed in your body. It's the same faith that gets your bills paid. It's the same faith that gets you a good job. It's the same faith that will uh, make a difference in your children's life. It's the same faith that will heal ha families and homes. It's the same faith that will change life. It's the same faith that said, let there be light, and there was. It's as simple as the day you got saved. And if it becomes anything else, You've complicated it. Now, go with me to Romans chapter 10. I told you I'd give you a, another scripture to back up what I'm telling you about faith. So that way you don't have to just believe it as my opinion. It's not. It's biblical truth. But here in Romans chapter 8, or excuse me, chapter 10, verse 8, it says, But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, what's this word of faith that you preach, Paul? Paul, what did you say? If you confess with your mouth, isn't that saying... Now, check this out. If you have a Bible handy or you can do it on your smart tablet or whatever it is, you need to highlight that word confess. Because you know what that word confess is? It's a compound word in the original Greek that the scripture was originally written in. And it means this. It literally means to say the same thing. Now, everybody say this after me. Jesus is Lord. That's confession. You just said the same thing. How did we get it so far off? Religion. Always wants to make the truth something else. That's what it is. See? If you confess with your mouth, what's that mean? Just say with your mouth. Say what? Say the same thing that God's word says. Say the same thing that God says. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, what are we doing? We're saying the same thing. Yes, he is Jesus. Yes, he is the Son of God. Yes, he is the Lord. We're saying the same thing. 
and believe in your heart. There's that believe again. Believe in your heart. That God has raised him from the dead. Uh, you will be saved. And again, that word saved is the word sozo. And if you don't know it by now, get ready to continue to learn. That word sozo means to be saved, healed, delivered, set free, made well, made whole, preserved, protected, and caused to prosper. Again, it means to be saved, healed, delivered, set free, made well, made whole, preserved, protected, and caused to prosper. You getting it? Saved, healed, delivered, set free, made well, made whole, preserved, protected, and caused to prosper. Anybody need any of that today? A saved, healed, delivered, set free, made well, made whole, preserved, protected, and caused to prosper. I don't know about you, but I can use some of that today. Mm-hmm. Notice what he says. You will be saved. For with the heart, one does what? Believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession, or saying the same thing, is made unto salvation. Let me ask you this. When did you get saved? When you believed or when you confessed? Thank you. That's right. Confession. You could stand there and say, I believe. That's why people all over the world, they say, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But you know what? It doesn't bear any fruit. You know why? Because they're not saying. And when some people say it, they're not saying it as a conviction of their heart. They're not saying it because they really believe it in the sense that, yes, he is the Lord of glory. Yes, he is my Lord and my Savior. Hmm? See, we see the context of faith in both these verses of Mark 11 and uh, uh, Romans 10. Now, I want to share a story with you, <coughs> excuse me, about uh, uh, this woman in Mark chapter 5. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all, all of it and read every bit of it. But you'll remember the story. We'll at least begin with it. And verse 25 says, Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. How many of you remember that story? 12 years. How many of you know 12 years is just 12 years too long? <laughs> Amen. And had suffered many things from many physicians, and she spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. How many of you know that's a bad day? When she, watch, verse 27, when she heard about, how does faith come? Guess what happened? Faith came. Faith came. Faith came for her to believe and act on it. She came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, the actual Greek says she kept saying, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. When did she believe? When she heard. Then what did she do? She acted on what she believed. What's that? Faith. She came in from behind, and she touched his garment, and she was made completely whole. There's a wonderful story right there, biblical truth that helps us to see faith, believing, and confessing. She heard, she believed. She responded, that's faith. Because faith, faith involves believing, but it's taking believing into an action of doing, whether by saying or acting. Notice it says that, okay. All right. I want to touch on the subject of hope before we partake of the Lord's table today. Again, like I said, I want us to do this as a matter of applying these truths to our life, enjoying the table of the Lord, as well as using it as a demonstration on how we can apply it to our personal lives. Now, you have to understand that Bible hope is different than worldly hope. Worldly hope is a wish. Well, I sure hope that happens. Well, don't get your hopes up. Right? If you use this kind of hope, the worldly hope, as a guiding principle, then you'll be wishy-washy. 
mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, like a fish flopping around outside the water. See, when I was a boy, I hoped for a motorcycle for Christmas. I heard the story of some boy who believed God. He prayed and asked God to give him a motorcycle for Christmas. He got a motorcycle. I thought, wow, that's awesome. I'm going to do that. Well, the only problem I had was my father kept letting me know I wasn't getting a motorcycle. But I still kept hoping. Guess what? I didn't get on Christmas. That's because I was using worldly hope. Not only that, but my father's authority superseded mine because he was my father. Amen. <clears throat> but notice here at Romans chapter 4 and verse 18. Here's a wonderful biblical example about the subject of hope. Romans 4, 18, talking about Abraham, the father of faith. It says, who was contrary to hope. How many of you know what that means? That means that Abraham was beyond hope. Beyond hope for what? He was beyond hope to father a child. Let me ask you this. How many 90-year-old men you know that are fathering children? I guarantee you they are few. You can probably count them on one hand and don't need more than maybe uh, one digit. Who beyond hope? You know, it tells us that Sarah talks about the deadness of Sarah's womb. And forgive me, I don't mean to sound crude here today in church, but you know what that means. She was dried up, if you will. They were both beyond hope as far as natural, worldly hope. How could you possibly even wish or whim or whatever that you'd have a child when you're already that far in age? It says, who contrary to hope. He was beyond worldly hope. He was beyond natural hope. In hope believed. That word hope, check this out, means an earnest expectation to receive. An earnest expectation to receive. Very similar to faith, isn't it? That's why hope and faith work together. Now faith is the substance of things earnestly expected. See, Abraham was beyond all natural hope. But he knew that he had a word from God. And he believed God. And he exercised his faith in God, and that's why he's known as the father of faith. And in that faith, he continued to maintain his hope. Ten years. It took over ten years for him to get his son from the moment he began to exercise his faith. We think if we got to go ten days, it's been too long. Sometimes we think ten minutes is beyond the limit. Abraham was 10 years. 10 years. Can you believe that? And check this out. His body's getting older. Listen, I don't know about 90. I haven't got there yet. But I know the difference between 50 and 57. And I know that when I see 60, it's going to be different than when I was 50. So I, there, you can't tell me that this man wasn't walking around at 90 years of age, you know, saying, boy, you know, hey. You, do, you know, I'm sure he didn't do it, but can you imagine if Abraham were like most of us, he and Sarah would have been in a tent talking one day, and he'd be saying, I don't know why the Lord's taking so long. You know, I'm not getting any younger. Like as if it was really up to him in the first place. God did such a work on Abraham that he fathered children after Sarah died. You know what that means? Faith does not depend on the natural circumstance. It supersedes the natural circumstance. Abraham was beyond natural hope, but he hoped on in faith. He continued to believe God. He continued to exercise his faith by what he said and he did. Can you imagine that? He was Abram, changed his name to Abraham father of many nations. Can you imagine that? Every time, do you think there was ever a time when Abraham went to introduce himself after God changed his name that he wanted to say Abram instead of Abraham? I'm the father of many nations. Sure you are. Abraham was calling those things to be not as though they were before they ever were. 
Hello. Hello, I'm Abraham, father of many nations. Don't have a child. I don't know when I'm getting him. But I got a promise. I got a word. And I know who gave it to me. And I know he's faithful. And so I will not relent. I will not give up. I'll not turn my back. Doesn't matter if the clock keeps ticking. Doesn't matter if the knees start aching. Doesn't matter if I start feeling old. It doesn't even matter what Sarah looks like. I know my God. And he said, so that's the way it is. He continued to believe. He continued to hope. He continued to exercise his faith. See, when Bible hope floats your boat and guides you through the storm, your faith will work and your love will prevail. Look at Proverbs 13 and verse 12. Well, we're on the subject of hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Know anybody struggling with depression? Hope deferred. Know anybody struggling in their mind because, you know, as far as uh, depression and those things are concerned? Hope deferred. And you know, that's why in this world system, it's almost impossible to have hope other than worldly hope which is not reliable at all. It will evaporate just as fast as the mist and the wind. That's why David said there in Psalms, Why art thou so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. See, we need to have our hope in the Lord. Our hope needs to be in the Lord. That's why it says in Hebrews that hope is the anchor of the soul. See, when what we hope for, and I'm talking about Bible hope, when we have Bible hope, that earnest expectation, we, we've heard the word of God, faith has come. Now we believe it in our hearts, and we're speaking and acting like it's so, and we are earnestly expecting the full manifestation of it, right? Right? So what happens as time goes on and it seems to be delayed, if we do not guard ourselves, we begin to fade in our hope, our expectation, which then begins to undermine our faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for. See that? And so then what happens is that that starts getting us to start wavering which means it's going to undermine our faith. James says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So you can't, you can't be in faith and doubt at the same time. Now, let me stop there and make this clarification. You can have faith in your heart and doubt in your head and still receive the promise. Notice it didn't say that if you believe in your head, it said to believe in your heart. I'm so glad that's, that that was said that way. Because I don't know about you, but when I first got into this thing about walking with the Lord and I heard this thing about faith, I thought I was in trouble. Because you know what? I would pray. Anybody ever do this? I would pray. Okay, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I believe I receive. Thank you. You know, I know what your word says. I have the Bible. I'm praying according to the word. I thank you that you hear me. You answer. I've got the answer. Thank you very much. Ding. I mean, no sooner than I said amen. Sometimes I couldn't even get to the amen before I'd have a thought in my head. They went completely against what I just prayed. Man. So I try to pray it again. Ding. After a while, you just quit. You're like, forget it. I can't do that one. Faith in your heart, no matter what's going on in your head, and you still receive. Always remember that. All right? So what we need to realize is that the enemy will do everything he can to make us think our faith is not working, to make us think that we are not receiving what we have been given by God's Word. And so what happens is, is that he will do what he can to help delay the manifestation. Because after all, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Cause you to become hopeless. 
And when you're hopeless, your faith doesn't work. You know, there was a time there where there was a lot of teaching about faith, so much to the point that it almost overran hope to where you couldn't have any hope. If you said the word hope in the, uh, in the rooms of people talking faith, you were, you know, something was wrong with you. Well, no, you just got to have it in the right context. Don't put faith where your hope should be and don't put your hope where your faith should be. Have them in the right place. <coughs> Amen. So let's pull this together and, and, and make it applicable to the Lord's table. And then that will serve as a demonstration for each of us to know how to apply this to our very personal lives, to our own lives, all right? Whether it's being, you know, pursuing a career, whether it's having to deal with family members, whatever the case may be. All right. So, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23 through 25, and then we will make this application. Paul says here in verse 20, uh, 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, <coughs> This is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so now, <coughs> let's make this an application of faith. We know that this table represents the sacrifice of the Lord. The bre bread represents his body that was broken for our healing. The cup represents the uh, blood that was shed for our redemption. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> now I get to practice what I'm preaching. All right, I'm going to step down here for the table and, and continue to talk to you. So, what is this? It's the bread. It's the wafer, right? But what it represents is the important thing here today. It represents Jesus' body that was broken for our healing. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Matthew 8, 17. 1 Peter 2, 24. Three verses. By a stripe she were healed. <clears throat> so as a matter of faith, a matter of love, and a matter of hope. I can look at this and say, well, you know, that's just a wafer. This is just a ceremony that we do at church. Or I can look at that and say, you know what, Lord, that reminds me of what you did. And I believe your word. I believe you did take that beating upon your body fulfilled those script, the scripture in there in Isaiah. And by doing so, you made provision for me to be able to receive divine, supernatural health and healing into my body. And so as I partake this way for today, Lord, I do so as an act of faith. I do so because that's what I believe, and that's what I say, and that's how I'm going to act. So as I partake, I thank you that I have health and healing in my body in Jesus name you see that now what am I doing remember faith is what believing with your heart and saying with your mouth love we talked about love first Corinthians 13 4 through 8 one of the things about love is love believes the best loves hopes or uh, never fail right and hope the earnest expectation to receive so I expect to receive. I expect that when I release my faith, when I believe, when I say, when I act accordingly, I expect to receive healing power into my body that makes me whole. I expect. Well, what are you going to do, Pastor, if nothing changes? I'm going to keep on expecting. Well, what are you going to do, Pastor, if it doesn't seem any different? I'm going to keep expecting. Because, see, I know my God loves me. See, that's the first context. See, if you and I really knew how much God loved us, we would never question God's provision for us. Think about it. If you grew up in a loving home and you had loving parents 
and they told you they were going to do something for you, you didn't wonder if they were going to or not. You always knew they would. Now, if you didn't grow up in that kind of environment, I'm sorry for that. Uh, uh, but I can tell you that, you know, those who did, you're blessed. But our Father God is so much better than any earthly parent. And he loves us so much. Do you really think that God could love us the way he did, sacrifice his own son, and not want you to be whole? Do you really think he wouldn't want you to be free of anything that you need to be free of? Do you really think that he would not want to heal your... Do you really think that he would go to all... So, okay, here, here's the big deal. So, God says, I love you so much, I'm going to give my only son. Here you go. Jesus says, I love you so much, I'm going to leave heaven. I'm going to come to earth. And I'm going to go on that cross. I'm going to hang there. They're going to beat me to a bloody pulp. And then I'm going to hang on that cross just because I love you. Raises from the dead, goes to the right hand of the Father, seats at the, uh, seated at the right hand of the Father, lives forevermore so that he can make sure that we are loved. So that we are provided for so that we are cared for and then it's like oh by the way I've changed my mind you can't have healing today oh by the way I've decided that you need to wait a little longer so that you can have greater piety in your life oh by the way I want you to learn something first those are not biblical truths those are religious lies steeped into the church by hell itself let me ask you something. When is it God's will for someone to be born again? Now, I'm setting you up. I'm telling you that right now. Thank you, sir. Now is the accepted time, is what the scripture says. Another scripture says it this way, to, that today is the day of, come on, help me out. Day of what? Salvation. Whoa. Whoa. Guess what that word salvation is? Sozo. Today's the day to be saved. Today's the day to be delivered. Today's the day to be healed, made whole, made well, preserved, protected, and caused to prosper. Today's your day. Not tomorrow, not next year, today. Yeah, but pastor, what about if I don't feel anything? You don't have to. I felt this warm glow come over me, hit my head, went all the way through. That's wonderful when people have that. But you know what? You can still get healed whether you feel a warm glow or not. Well, you know, they put their hand on me. Next thing I knew, I was on the floor. Wonderful. That's great too. But you know what? You can get healed without ever hitting the floor. Well, you know, I knelt down and God just visited me. That's wonderful. But you know, you don't even have to kneel. Man looks on the outward appearance but God looks on the heart. That's the most important part. Because why? Your faith comes from the heart. That's where we believe. See? Faith, hope, and love. They bring us to the table. They provide us the wafer and the cup. Faith, hope, and love enables us to personally do our part to come to the table to receive the wafer, to receive the cup. Not just the physical items that we touch with our hands, but the provisions that they offer us because of the sacrifice that was made. Do you see that? Today, as we partake of the Lord's table together, we do so by and through faith, hope, and love. And when we do, we see God's provisions and blessings in and upon our life every time. Every time. Ushers, would you come forward, please?